All right. And so this we get started. Um, kia ora, everyone. Um, my name is Andrea. I work for the PSA, as most of you know, who are here today. I will start with Fakatofi, as always, before um, I introduce a guest that uh, will be quite well known to you all right now as well. But uh, yeah, let me start with the Fakatofi. Kona pai tafiti faya kia tata. Kona pai tata fakamawa kia tina. And it means the potential for tomorrow depends on what we do today. And I thought it's a, quite an appropriate fakatofi because it um, highlights the importance to consider future generations in what we do today. And obviously the government yesterday has released um, its budget and uh, it has implications for those of us who live in New Zealand um, today, but also for those living in New Zealand tomorrow and the day after. Um, it's very important for future generations, especially with regards to the investments made in health and um, into the environment. So we'll hear about all of that today from uh, Craig Rennie, the economist from the CTU. You know, maybe, you know, Craig, from an earlier webinar that we did um, with Bernard Hickey. Um, just last week before the budget was released. So welcome everyone to hear from Craig after the budget uh, has been released yesterday. And um, he will share some of the analysis with us today. So awesome to have you all here. Um, Craig will give us a bit of an overview, as um, I mentioned, for about half an hour, and then at the end there will be time for questions. So feel free to use the question answer function as always. Try to keep your questions succinct and um, short. That makes it easier to bring them into the conversation and they will be clearer as well and you get the answer that you would like to get. So, um, yeah, I think that's probably all for me, Craig. I'll just um, hand over to you. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. And um, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Craig Rennie, and I'm the Economist and Director of Policy at the New Zealand Council of Trade Unions. Um, prior to joining um, the CTU um, in 2021, I was Grant Robertson's Economic Advisor for five years. So I've written three of these budgets. Um, and cost the two manifestos. So I've got a little bit of experience about how they work from the, the inside. Um, and um, it was another fascinating budget uh, yesterday. It was the fourth well-being budget, the fifth budget um, of this government. Um, and there was a lot of spending. Um, there was a lot of heat. There's been a lot of noise um, uh, about this budget. Um, it's being seen as a very political budget. There's, a, there's been an election next year. And what gets done today is what will be on the table at the election time. Um, it's not in the next budget, that will be too late. It's what's actually done today, it's what people will be able to see and feel when they're making, and they're putting the little X in the box um, at the next election. Um, so um, with that in mind, I will just briefly take you through what we're gonna talk through today. Um, if we can get the IT to work, fantastic. Um, so uh, if you can press the button again, uh, there's, we'll do a little bit of background to the budget, some politics that have been taking place, what does the budget do overall in terms of the uh, the, the sort of the, the, the overall fiscal position? What are the economic indicators saying? So what's actually happening rather than what you're being told is actually happening? What investments, and this is really just the key investments, and um, to put it into context, um, there are 17 books in the budget, um, each one of which um, sets out the investments. I won't run through all of them. I'll just run through the key investments that I think are really noteworthy, but happy to take questions on any investments that you may want to look at. What do we at the CTU um, think um, of the budget? Um, and then finally, um, happy to take any questions that you have then. So um, one of the things you may want to do um, in about an hour's time, this document um, will go online. Um, there's our 50 page analysis um, going through all of the key sections um, of the budget going through um, setting out what's happened, who's winning, who's losing. Um, and uh, if you want to look at any more detail, really understand what's going on in Budget 22, um, that document will be available from the CTU's website 
in about an hour and a half's time once, once the formatting's finished. Um, so um, I, and I'll happily share um, the web link uh, with the PSA so that you can, uh, you can share it internally as well. Um, so back onto the budget, I don't need to tell anybody um, on this call that the cost of living and inflation has really dominated the headlines over the past few weeks. Inflation is currently 6.9 cents, and that's the highest it's been in 30 years. For low-income groups, it's actually much higher than that because more of their income is taken up with rent, with food, with fuel. And as a consequence, they're paying even more than that. And there are some treasury estimates that currently inflation for low-income groups is around 25% rather than 6.9%. And as a consequence, this has been causing no end of problems for the government. Tied with that, um, slowdowns in China caused by COVID resurgence, the conflict in the Ukraine, um, and supply chain bottlenecks and supply chain disruptions, you know, we had weaker than expected international growth. That feeds through in New Zealand to weaker than expected tax revenue. That means the Crown has the less to spend, or if it wants to spend the same, it has to borrow more. No finance minister wants to make that decision, but that's been forced upon this finance minister as a consequence of the economic context that we find ourselves in. Together with that, there's been a, an increasing political narrative. You've often heard the drumbeat of this call for wasteful spending. Um, anytime the government tries to spend anything, it's wasteful. And anytime the, the government tries to do anything the opposition doesn't agree with, it's wasteful spending. And you've seen that grow, grow more and more currency with the public. I personally believe it, but it's you know it's it's a story which um, which, is, which is gathering traction with the public. Um, at exactly the same time, the government actually should be investing. We have long-term underinvestments in many core parts of the public sector and certainly in parts of the public realm. The Treasury identified a $104 billion infrastructure gap that exists in New Zealand right now. That's $104 billion of public sector infrastructure that should exist that we don't have funding for. And that gap is going to grow larger and larger and larger unless we invest and get ahead of and the investments that we need to make. So at exactly the same time, we should be investing. We should be looking through some short-run economic, economic wobbles that we have. We've got this narrative of wasteful spending, and it's trying. It's making any additional expenditure very difficult to talk to. Finally, the, New Zealand, the needs of New Zealanders are growing. We've seen the, wait, the social housing wait list grow to 25,000 households. Um, child poverty indicators haven't continue to decline in the way that the government would certainly want them to have declined. In fact, the after housing cost child indicator is going backwards. Um, and we've got this backlog of unmet health needs as a consequence of COVID. Hospitals having to close, wards having to close. And as a consequence, there's a backlog of need which needs to be met again and need to find funding for that. Now, at this point in time, um, as an economist, I have to give you a legal disclaimer, which is that everything that's in here is basically a treasury forecast. Um, treasury forecasts um, are what we what we like to call in the trade an evolving art. Um, now, I'm not having go any of my former treasury colleagues. I am not. The treasury puts together um, the budget um, with great care and attention. And there are lots of treasury analysts who work more hours than they should um, pulling this, pulling the, the document together. But treasury forecasts are just that. They are forecasts. They're often wrong. They're often wrong in many ways. And so you shouldn't take too much store by what's in the forecasts, especially as you go out a few years. Think of it as a guide rather than as an absolute decision as to where things are going to. Let's begin. Um, so what does the budget do overall? Um, I would argue, um, and the CTU argue, this budget has been precision engineered not to really scare anyone. There are no very significant investments with one exception. Um, which um, you know, does anything that anyone can really disagree with. It's very difficult to disagree with the investments in health. There's a long-standing need in health. It's well understood. Clearing the debt in health makes perfect sense. It's very difficult to argue with that one, but there's no big spending in a controversial area or any big removal of spending from a controversial area. The budget also draws a line in the sand. The Minister of Finance during the presentations talked repeatedly about the previous two budgets being crisis budgets, dealing with COVID, dealing with its aftermath, dealing with the public health consequences. 
this is a line in the sand. This is about returning to what Minister of Finance, the Prime Minister, called a new normal. And we'll come on to that phrase because it's actually quite important. There was record new operating investment, uh, operating spending um, as part of this. So operating spending, day-to-day spending rather than capital spending, which is spending you spend on, on physical things, assets that you own for a long period of time. And that operating spending was $6 billion this year. Um, that's the largest for many a year, even on an inflation-adjusted uh, basis. Um, the, the, but however, despite all of that spending, there's a gradual return to normal in all of the economic indicators. We're seeing a gradual return to basically uh, uh, the kind of situation that we saw um, before COVID, where debt is around 20% of GDP, government spending is around 30% of GDP. And you can basically draw a straight line straight through from where Bill English and John Key were to where um, Rand Robertson is right now. The Treasury consensus on what the government should be doing has won in that space. Government debt and spending levels remain steady or actually fall um, across the forecast period. Um, the government is spending across the forecast period 30.8% of GDP. That is exactly the same as the forecast as the period between John Key and Bill English. Now, there are some very specific funding for health, climate change, and some welfare payments. And we'll come on to those in a little bit more um, detail. But it's fair to say that for health, this is actually life changing amounts um, of money. Um, but if you take nothing else away from this presentation, take this. 70% of all of the spending inside this budget, this big spending budget, is just to keep the lights on. It's actually not to do anything new. And that's up from 59% at the last budget. And that's the impact of inflation on the budget. So the majority of the spending here is not actually to do anything new. It's not to do anything sexy or different. It's actually just um, to keep the lights on. And as has been well advertised, there was a temporary cost of living um, adjustment um, designed for the squeezed middle. Um, so those who don't receive crown support in any other way, but who may well be doing it tough because they're on a low to middle income. So what are the economic indicators saying? Now, we've heard a lot of stories and there have been very erudite, well-paid economists um, who are telling us um, we're heading for a recession. Things are looking very bleak. Um, let me be the first to tell you that economics is called the dismal science for a reason, um, and where we can professionally both bore you and terrify you at the same time. Um, the Treasury, however, doesn't see a recession. Um, the Treasury sees growth um, in every year um, of the forecast period, um, and growth in the, in the next year is actually higher than was forecast a year ago. It's lower later on, um, but next year it's, it's, it's higher um, than was forecast. And we've seen growth be higher across each of those years um, than was forecast last year. So the economy's actually done better. The resilience to COVID is demonstrated in that chart. And if we look at unemployment, again, it's the same story. Now, the red line represents what we thought unemployment was going to be at the height of COVID. Unemployment was going to spike to 10%. Um, we set up the wage subsidy scheme in anticipation of hundreds of thousands of job layoffs um, at that particular point in time. Thankfully, that never occurred. And then a year later, at Budget 21, we had a yellow line on the chart. So we thought unemployment was going to rise Gently, but you know, quite rapidly, up to five and a half percent, and then gradually decline from there. What's happened in reality is unemployment has sunk to a new low, to three point two percent. And the Treasury now forecasts that unemployment will will fall to a thirty odd year low of three percent, and that is effectively full employment um, in New Zealand. Um, we will that we have not seen that level of unemployment since the nineteen seventies. It then starts to rise after that, actually mainly as a consequence um, of the Treasury's forecasting model. The Treasury's forecasting model has a, a longer term average of unemployment of around 4.2, 4.5%. So it assumes you head back to that place over time. But there's going to be sustained low unemployment um, in the forecast period. And we can demonstrate this again with the job seeking numbers because you can be on job seeker but not, a, not unemployed. Um, so we can see the number of job seekers 
um, in the black line, which is the line from this budget, is lower than the forecast a year ago, but back towards the end period starts to peak. Um, again, but again, much lower than the figures that we anticipated um, at the height of COVID. At the height of COVID, we were expecting 250,000 people to be on job seeker. Um, so at 180,000, 70,000 away um, from that. And we should really credit the success of the government's response to COVID and keeping people both in work and keeping the economy going during COVID. Now, for many of you, one of the key things, if nothing you'd be really wanting to know, essentially is, What's my wage and what's inflation? And am I getting ahead or am I going backwards? Because currently, a lot of people feel as if they're going backwards. Now, on the screen, you'll find a black line. That black line is CPI inflation. The red line is the quarterly earnings survey, annual hourly hours, hourly wages. So this is the average wage on average across New Zealand and the growth of that. And you can see um, in the lead up to uh, 2021, 2022, um, Hourly wages were rising faster than inflation. People were getting ahead. This year, not so much. And people can feel that. And, uh, you know, I don't, again, don't need to tell people on the call that, uh, you know, they can feel what's going on there. Um, but good news, the Treasury is of the strong opinion that I'm um, starting um, from June 2022. Um, hourly wages will start rising faster than inflation again. You see that workers, on average, now, in, lots of workers won't, but on average, New Zealand workers will start getting ahead of inflation and start seeing real wage increases. And there's real wage increases every year in the forecast period. And so by the time you get to 24, 25, wages are rising roughly twice as fast as inflation. So there's some real heat in the economy and workers will start to feel the benefit of that, albeit a little bit, starting from next year. Now, for many of you, You'll also be concerned about house prices. If, like me, you've been stupid enough to buy a house recently, um, you may well have had a mortgage, which makes you keeps you awake at night, um, and you're now worrying about whether or not the mortgage on the house is now worth less than the property that you purchased it. Um, now, um, the news from uh, this current document, uh, from the current uh, budget, um, is not great on that behalf, um, but it's also not apocalyptic. Um, we see a roughly 2.5% fall um, in house prices penciled in for the next uh, financial fiscal year, which is 2022-2023. Um, uh, um, that's coming off the back of a 30% increase in 2020-2021 and a 5% increase in this year. It then returns basically to flatline across the forecast period. And if you were to draw this line longer out of time in terms of the Treasury's forecast, it actually remains flat across the time period. So with inflation being higher than house prices, essentially um, the value of your mortgage and the value of house prices will um, decouple over time in a very gradual sense, according to Treasury. But what there's not is a 1980s or 1990s style house price crash penciled in here. Um, so if you've just bought a house or you're looking for a house, um, I've, I haven't got good news for you, but I also don't have terrible news. Now, with all of that in mind, strong economy, low unemployment, wages getting ahead of inflation, and house prices not disappearing um, through the floor, what investments is the budget making? Now, what we're not doing is borrowing a huge amount of money. Net core crown debt, which is the old tax measure, I won't bore you with the details of why, but net core crown debt, um, as you can see, in every year post 2018 is lower than it was anticipated to be just a year ago. In fact, net core crown debt peaks in, in this year, uh, that's forthcoming, and then starts to broadly decline. And again, if you were to draw this chart out again, you would see that decline continue and continue and continue, um, back down to around 30% 10 years from now. So essentially, there's, there is no debt crisis in New Zealand. And um, there certainly is no public debt crisis in New Zealand. Most countries which are comparable with New Zealand, Australia, the US, Canada, the UK, um, would happily sell their firstborn into bonded slavery to have the net core crown debt figures that we have. We have enormous levels of fiscal headroom and um, we have triple A rated accounts. We have absolutely no problems with debt in New Zealand. Um, and what we also see um, is that net core crown expenses, so what we're spending 
spiked in 2020 and in 1920, as you would expect, COVID fell back as we thought we'd beaten COVID. Omicron turns up, we start spending more money again because we have to, we have more wage subsidies, we're spending more money to support the economy. But after that, we see net crore crown expenses start to fall year on year on year. Again, back to that long run consensus around 30% of GDP. And we see net crore crown revenue um, rise in each year of the forecast period. But again, gently rise in each round year of the forecast period, which suggests it's growth, it's economic growth and it's expenditure that's driving that. So there's nothing terribly exciting in these figures, but that's also good news. We're not anticipating the crown spending all of the money or desperately going in a cash flash, and we're not seeing more and more and more of what's in your pocket being eaten away by taxation. Now, this is a slightly complicated chart, so I hope we have a large screen as I do here. Um, but why I put this on here because what I really want you to understand is how skewed all of the new spending is in the budget. On the left-hand side, as it is for me, um, you have um, health. Um, the red bars represent uh, what happened in 21-22, uh, the black bars 22-23, and the grey bars um, are 23-24. And what you can see is health, social security, and education are the big winners um, from budgets, this budget and the next budget, in terms of where all the cash is going. Um, health, because we're paying off the debt of the DHBs and we're investing record amounts of money in health service purchasing. Social security and welfare, because at the last budget, we saw big increases in welfare payments, um, pencil which started on the 1st of April this year. Um, and we're seeing um, uh, some further big increases in things like disability support uh, come through. Um, and then education, because we're seeing uh, the role for the reform of vocational education re uh, reforms, and we're seeing the equity indexes and other things come through, which is lifting education um, expenditure. What you can then see beyond those big three, there aren't really big increases anywhere else. Environmental protection, which reflects the expenditure through the emissions reductions plan documents into the climate change expenditure. Um, but when you look at defence, you look at economic services, you look at core government services, they're all dwarfed by health expenditure and they're dwarfed by social security and education. Now, before anybody gets worried about that, that's pretty normal, but we're at the extreme end of normal. We're seeing these large increases certainly show you where the marginal dollars, where those tax differences are going and our spending is going in New Zealand. Health social security and education. And if we look to the main spending areas outlined um, in this budget, and if anybody wants to find out where all these things are, there are two documents I'd recommend, um, one of which is this thick document, um, which is the Wellbeing Budget um, actual publication, front cover by the Right Honourable Grant Robertson. This is actually his photo. Um, and it's there. Um, at the back of this document is a thing called the Summary of Initiatives, and it sets out for everyone what every line of new expenditure is. So if you want to look for your area, or you want to know what's going on for an area that you have a particular interest in, this will set out for the forecast period every cent of new expenditure and laid out clearly what it's going to be spent on. And it's actually, it's not a straightforward read, but it's a much easier read than anything else. If that's too hard or you don't have time, this document, which is what we call the budget at a glance, which sets out in a pamphlet form, in a really easy form, actually, what's actually in here. So if you take nothing else away, that is available and that will tell you um, in a really short order what's actually there. But the key takeaways, health saw $11.1 billion of new spending over the next two years. Now, a part of that is going to pay off the debt of the DHBs as they move into the new health structure. Um, but significant amounts, $1.8 billion this year, $1.3 billion in the next year, um, is going into health services to provide certainty of funding, but also to provide the kinds of levels of funding to give the health service what the Minister of Health called a sustainable financial footing. Together with that, there's $1.3 billion of new capital spending that's outlined in the budget. Again, um, 
that, that means there's now six and a half billion dollars of capital spending uh, taking place in health over the next few years. To put that into context, in 2017, health capital spending was $350 million. So we're spending many multiples on health capital, rebuilding hospitals, rebuilding health centers, delivering new IT, delivering new systems, um, and catching up with the more than $15 billion infrastructure gap that exists in health in New Zealand. There was $1 billion out outlined for disability services, including a new ministry for disability. Um, and uh, with the majority of that funding, $700 million going into the disability services support scheme, which will provide goods and services for people who have particular needs. Now, great, lots of money, fantastic. Question. Um, there's no new money in here for health service reorganization. So at the last budget, $468 million was set aside for health service reorganization. Everything we know from overseas, from health road service reorganization, is that reorganizing your health service is both expensive and time consuming. And $468 million across a three, four year period might not touch the science. So where is the money for any further call on health service reorganization going to come from? And it's not clear in this service. Is it coming from health services itself or is it coming from somewhere else? Or is the Crown gonna put up more money if that's the case? But the fact there's not even any contingency money that we can see does raise questions about to what extent there is sufficient money in the health system right now, despite record spending, to actually deal with the reorganization that may take place. Um, there was also um, a very small amount of money, $76 million, of which only $39 million is real um, for health services and health workforces to create the nurses, the doctors, the uh, psychiatrists, the psychologists, the physiotherapists. Um, that's a really small amount of money. That's actually an, a highly inadequate amount of money um, and really won't go anywhere near to tackle the 4,000 um, places and um, empty nursing spots that we have in New Zealand. In terms of climate change, um, the big news was announced on Monday um, ahead of the budget um, when the emissions reductions plan was announced. Um, and as signaled, um, $4.5 billion of new spending to support climate change and to small, support emissions reductions has been outlined. Um, and the government has spent somewhere in the order um, of 60% of that already. Um, uh, uh, on new initiatives um, that will deliver uh, climate change reductions to deliver on our new climate budgets. Um, but very immediately, uh, the government committed to public transport uh, prices continuing to be halved for the next two months. Um, on the other side of that, it also kept the fuel duty cut. So quite how you're managing your climate change emissions during that is, is a bit of a mixed bag. But um, uh, um, it, it's fair to say two months, the government's taking a big bet. The government's essentially saying in two months time, inflation will be lower. Um, I think that's a bit of a gamble. It's honest. And we might well be back here in two months time um, begging for another cut in both public transport and fuel duty. Now in justice, there was a really interesting um, decision in justice to move to what's called a cluster um, approach. Um, and the justice cluster is not only um, justice, but it's a range of departments and areas like police, like corrections, um, like the Attorney General. Um, and that was in $2.7 billion in total new operating spending and $25 million in new capital funding for a shared service, shared outcome set of activities. Um, and this is really innovative and new. We're going to have to see whether or not that works, how the transparency and the, the lines of responsibility work for this in the future. Um, but if it does work, it may well lead to that cluster approach being delivered in new areas in social development and um, being delivered um, in, in housing and elsewhere where you bring departments together and you pool sets of funds in ways that are highly unusual in New Zealand experience. But that funding is really welcome. There's really welcome funding um, for both public servants in that money, for policy development in that money, and for the expansion of policy services and justice. There's also money to clear backlogs for both the court system um, and, uh, and, and for other systems that have been uh, clogged up as a consequence um, of COVID. Um, in education, there were essentially two big spending um, announcements, one of which was $300 million 
to replace the decile index with an equity index. Now, that's great. Um, it goes some of the way to address that problem, not all of the way. We're, you know, roughly speaking, we're half the way there. Um, across uh, the developed world, um, equity funding makes up, generally speaking, around 6% of all um, education funding. In New Zealand, it's 3.6% now. But again, it's a step beyond where we were. Um, and it will certainly make um, uh, for a fairer distribution we know, um, of scarce education resources across schools. Um, in less good news, um, well, in good news and in bad news, um, $266 million for pay equity for ACE teachers, hugely welcome, absolutely necessary. But we're still only a little bit equal. We're not all the way there equal. It's a bit like being a bit pregnant. Um, you're a bit equal. Um, so there's still parts of the ECE chain who will not feel the value of pay equity uh, uh, funding, particularly in management. Um, so we need to see continued investment in that space. But $266 million will make a huge difference for many ECE staff and for many ECE centres up and down um, New Zealand. In housing, we saw an additional $1 billion to support emergency, temporary and new state housing. Now, um, great, fantastic, there's huge need in housing. The challenge we have is this is rent. This is not buying new places. This is just simply supporting places we already have or supporting the rents for new state properties that we've just built. Great news, but it doesn't build a new home. It just keeps the motels open. It just keeps the temporary emergency places open. We need to be seeing huge levels more investment in housing. It's the biggest um, driver of poverty. It's the biggest driver of poor health outcomes. It's the biggest driver of inequality in New Zealand. Um, and we don't invest anywhere near enough um, to make that problem go away in New Zealand. And the $1 billion is very welcome, but it just keeps the lights on in the current system rather than doing anything new or exciting. And then finally, an economic development. Um, and, and this thing, you asked me what Microsoft has was um, in this. Um, there's um, a range of investment to support um, uh, things like fair pay agreements, which is huge in the system. Um, the, uh, the, the budget provided funding to provide for two new fair pay agreement settlements um, in each year, uh, the forecast period. Um, and it also provided money um, for the continued development um, of the New Zealand um, Income Insurance Scheme, which is currently uh, it's having its uh, it's having a reading uh, for ACC through the House right now. It's budget urgency, um, and both of those we think in the future will make an enormous difference um, to industrial relations and to workplace relations in New Zealand. And the Crown signalled very welcome um, funding for both policy development, but also um, to make sure that we can when we get through uh, legislation, if we decide to get there, then. Um, uh, these things can both happen and it could happen really well. So really welcome stuff. And that really was my Christmas present. Um is there any slight technical issue with the with your PowerPoint? Brute force it, fantastic. Now again, um one thing that you may well have heard as part of this budget, and you know, the one thing that uh, the press and commentators have been fantastically interested in talking about is this cost of living payment that's being made to people. So the budget included $1 billion cost of living package, um, of which approximately $800 million um, was provided uh, to uh, people who are on low and middle incomes um, and who don't receive any other form of support, in particular the winter energy payment. Um, now, um, that provides 350 bucks in three monthly installments. You don't need to apply for this. It will be worked out automatically for you. Um, and you will receive it um, in three parts, um, and it's to help manage the cost of living challenges that many of us face um, right now. Um, it's worth approximately $27 a week um, for those three months. Um, and for many people, you know, especially in a household where both, um, uh, both earners receive that level of income, um, that's essentially $54 a week extra um, to that household. Um, and it will benefit 2.1 million New Zealanders. Um, it's a huge, it's the rabbit from the hat. The Minister of Finance often keeps a special surprise underneath the table and just pulls it out and says, there you go, 
this is the surprise. That's what everyone's going to talk about. And certainly on the day, that's exactly what everyone was talking about. Um, uh, it's, it's, you know, um, it reflects that cost of living challenge that the New Zealanders face right now, um, but it is temporary. And again, we may well be asking ourselves in a few months' time, what's next? So what do we think? Um, there's plenty to like in this budget. Um, it's a cost of living payment. There's funding and long-term funding for essential public services. There's money for schools, for hospitals, for ambulances. There's money um, for the public service. Um, we haven't shied away from looking through some of the current economic uncertainties and making sure we're investing in the long-term things. The things actually we know make a difference to so many people in New Zealand. And with a relatively calm, benign economic and fiscal indicators, a new normal is being delivered. 20% um, of GDP debt, 30% of GDP expenditure. The new normal looks an awful lot like the old normal. The question for me as an economist and the thing that I really fascinated about is, is that what we want? Is that what good looks like for New Zealand? Are we ambitious for more? Or do we actually just want to go back to where things were? I passionately believe that we shouldn't have just spent $74 billion in tackling COVID to go back to the problems that we had before COVID. Um, we shouldn't spend that sum of money to have the same homelessness challenges, to have the same child poverty challenges, to have the same um, uh, 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 underfunded and poor public services in places. And so we should use that to deliver a better future. And I don't want to go back to normal. Normal wasn't great for too many people. There's plenty of fiscal space for further investment in the future. We do have to walk a careful line. We can't just spend the money. You know, I've heard some commentators say, there's $50 billion available. Why don't we just spend it? Why don't we just set it aside, spend it? We can, we can make enormous differences in New Zealand. We couldn't spend that money if we tried. We actually, there's not, there's not the people to spend it on. There's no, if I wanted to build that, there's no gym in New Zealand. There's not, not enough concrete yeah. in New Zealand. So we couldn't do it. But there's plenty of fiscal space for us to have a plan and for us to be able to set up what good looks like and how we're going to get there. And that's my takeaway from this. The CTU would welcome more of a plan, a plan in the budget or a plan from government to build the country, to address our essential service needs and to fill that $104 billion infrastructure gap in a meaningful timetable, not just over the, between now and the heat death of the universe. The good news for everybody here, so there's one more budget to go before we have an election. It's one more chance to get this right. Um, and we hope and we want to work with the government and with, with unions and delegates and officials um, and with NGOs to see if we can get that plan um, for the country um, because everything else is there. The economic and fiscal indicators tell us we can do more, we should do more. Let's do it together. Thank you all for listening. Yeah, thank you. My God, um, Craig, that was amazing. You must have worked very hard last night to um, really get into the detail, analyze um, all the different um, uh, different uh, votes and uh, really get a good and deep understanding for what you just shared with us. So thank you so much, really valuable. Um, we are very close to the end of the webinar already. We had a few questions here, which I uh, might pass on to of you course. to um, answer, but there were a number of questions related to um, wages and to funding in, of pay equity yes. in other areas. You talked about education, but um, so maybe you can elaborate on yeah. that a little bit. And in terms of wages, there was one question um, about um, bringing wages more in line with um, Australian wages. Um, and does the budget actually help anything um, or does anything to support that? So maybe those two areas you yeah. could um, briefly talk about sure. before we close. Yeah, very quickly. Um, in terms of pay equity, um, the government's always in an invidious position um, because it can't tell you how much you will spend because otherwise it's not a negotiation. 
Um, so the government, the government generally doesn't say unless they've got an agreement. We're going to we want to, we we will spend up to a billion dollars on pay equity for nurses or teachers or economists. Um, because the first thing the economists union would turn around and say, billion dollars, you say, great. Well, that's our starting point, and we'll negotiate up from there. So um, they never really put the numbers in unless there's an agreement. However, table six, for those who are particularly um, well acquainted, um, of the back of the budget economic and fiscal update contains a, a line called the unallocated contingencies line. Yeah. The unallocated contingencies line this year has grown significantly. Um, that suggests that there is some money tucked away um, for pay equity deals um, uh, uh, by the government. So we have some hope that um, you know, money has been set aside. Obviously, negotiations will still have to take place. Um, but outside pay equity um, for ECE teachers, um, I would say you know, it's, it's up to unions and it's up to bargainers to get that deal going. And it's also up to the government to come to the table, as it hasn't done for nurses or for allied workers or elsewhere. Um, now, in terms of Australia, um, I'm going to give you a really simple and straightforward answer. Australia has fair pay agreements. New Zealand does not have fair pay agreements. Australia has national awards. New Zealand does not have national awards. As we get fair pay agreements, and as they spread out across workforces, occupations and industries, I think we'll see that gap with Australia start to close. I think that's a wonderful note to end on because that's very hopeful and we are on a good uh, path to actually implementing um, fair pay agreement or implementing fair pay agreements, uh, getting a bill for fair pay agreements and then going for implementation. So thank you so much, Craig, for you know sharing this um, really um, awesome uh, analysis with us. I thought it was very accessible. Um, it can be very difficult to understand the, the budget and um, all the different um, um, you know, nuances to it. So that was really useful. And I'm sure everyone online enjoyed it as well. I will pass on the um, questions. Thank you to everyone who joined us again today. It's always wonderful to have you in our webinars. Thanks for all the support behind the scenes. And do please check out the CTU's um, budget report which um, was mentioned by Craig earlier on. It will be released in roughly half an hour, maybe? In half an hour, three quarters of a while. I'm going to run back to the CTU and see if I can <laughs> press the go button. Fantastic. Uh, so it should be available on your website, yes. I guess. Yeah. So please uh, check it out there. And, um, and yeah, and hopefully it will be a good year um, for all of us ahead. Thank you very much. And I will close us with um, a Fakatoki. Na te roro, nao te roro, ka ora ai te iwi. With your basket and my basket, we will sustain everyone. So thank you everyone for coming on and stay well. Mm -hmm.